Well, good morning. Hey, that's a funny clip. But it's not so funny when we really think about the reality of how uh, debt could really uh, stress us out. Amen, church? Now, I want you for just a moment, just a moment to picture, picture what life could be like if you were debt free. (sighs) And some of you smile. And some of you that are pessimists are like, "Eh, don't put that evil thought in my mind. There's a a saying I came across this week. It says, debt keeps you stuck in the trap of using uh, your future to pay for your past. That's Mary Hunt. And I think many of us understand as we continue this new series that we started last week, the ABCs of financial freedom, that debt is horrific. That debt is like a Hoover vacuum cleaner that just kind of sucks the life out of our heart. Can any of you agree with that? Amen. So, so it kind of keeps you stuck. So I was surprised a few weeks ago uh, for my birthday, um, a lot of my family was in town for, for Drew's wedding and, and they surprised me by staying in town and that was actually a good thing. And um, there was 19 of us that went to Disneyland. And um, yes, I was that family that I always make fun of that was wearing the matching shirts, that was me. And so, um, so my wife had made these shirts, we're all walking around, it's fun. Uh, there's a ride in California Adventure. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a roller coaster, Goofy's roller coaster. I don't, I don't know the name of it, but it's this thing that just goes back and forth and it's just crazy. If you have any back or neck problems, you don't want to go on this thing. But I'm in there with one of my brother-in-laws. Now, it's hilarious because this is really for little kids and there's two of us that are jammed into this little thing, all right? And so we're going around and sure enough, we're zigging and we're zagging. And uh, then we get to the top and then all of a sudden, the ride completely stops. Now, I've never had this happen. So, so, so like I'm thinking, oh, just a few seconds, it gets going. No, it's minutes, five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes. We're stuck at the very top. Now, I can see my wife and other family members that are all kind of stuck there at the bottom, but I'm at the top. Now, here's the deal. If I'm on a roof, I'm good. I'm okay at those kind of heights. But if I'm at Dodger Stadium, I'm looking over the railing, oh, my legs just go. So there is an extent of of heights kind of fear factor for me. And so I'm looking across all of Disneyland and all of a sudden I'm realizing I'm stuck way up here and I'm starting to just kind of freak out a little bit. But of course, I'm a cool, collected individual. I can't let my brother-in-law know this. But this, this bar is on my lap and it is strapped so stinking tough, tight and we're, we're, we're just stuck in there like sardines in a can. And then this starts going through my mind. You can't move. You can't move. And now I'm looking across all of California Adventure, all these people that are moving around and they're having fun and I'm stuck on the top of this stinking roller coaster and I need out. And my heart begins to, to race. And my wife's here and laughing because she knows as she looked up that that was happening. That, that, that feeling of being stuck is no fun, amen, church? Now, here's the reality. A 21-year-old little Disney employee lady comes over, climbs up all the stairs, and she's got the magic key and unsnaps it. Now she tells me, I got to walk down all these stairs. That's for another sermon. (laughs) But you know, when we get stuck financially, when we're in debt and we feel that bar of life and the heaviness on us, and we look out and we see everyone else is having fun, but we're stuck, It's not fun, is it, church? Debt, debt is like that bar on the roller coaster that just keeps us stuck. And this whole series is about us as human beings realizing what the American dream has taught us is really a lie. 
that debt doesn't have to be a part of our life. That God has a bigger and greater plan for each of us. Are you ready? Am I ready? You see, last week we talked about uh, it's an attitude change. We have to have an attitude change when it comes to being financially free. If we want to achieve financial freedom, we've got to change our attitude. And we looked at from I don't need a plan to if I don't follow God's plan, I don't have a prayer. We talked about changing our attitude from what I do with my money is my business to what I do with God's money is God's business. We talked about attitude change from there's nothing I can do to there's nothing what? God can't do. And I want to tell you that right here, right now. There's nothing that God can't do in our lives, especially regarding this area of finances. We also talked about the attitude change from giving to get something to giving for no other reason than I love God. I want the goal for my life to be an extravagant giver. And if that's within the church or that's within my family or that's within my community or that's within my nation or within my world, I want to be extravagant. Many years ago, many years ago, it's been actually a year and a half, as your lead pastor, I shared with you five core values that we have as a church and we talked about uh, the, the fact that um, generosity is what this church is going to be known for. And, and I have a whole, I, I need an hour to just tell you about what God has been doing in this church to go beyond the walls into our community and be known as not the church that's asking for stuff, but giving stuff. Now, church, let's think about this. Wouldn't it be amazing if all the churches in this valley were known for the generosity that they have for its community? And I believe every church would like to be that, but I think there's churches that we've got debt, and so it prevents us from doing that. Just like in our own lives, I think most of us are generous people. We just can't do it because we got that bar stuck across our lap. And Jesus wants us to be set free. Honoring God with my wealth is where I want to end up. It's an attitude change to honoring God with my wealth is where I want to begin. One of the greatest hindrances to being able to give in the way that we really want to give, the way in which we were created, one of the biggest hindrances is the bondage of debt. So we're going to talk some more about that here this morning and see what God's word has to say. Let's pray. God, thank you for waking us up. Thank you for shaking us up. And God, I pray, as I did earlier, that this would be a, a, a moment in time where the shackles would hit the floor, the handcuffs would find themselves uh, dispensed into a trash can, that, 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 that the bar that holds us back, God, from, from being generous like you created us to be, that that bar would be set free, not from a 21-year-old Disney girl, but from your son, son, Jesus Christ. And God, we are claiming and asking, God, that even in this room in the next half hour or so, that you would put on our hearts the hope that we need to be able to live responsibly in this area that holds us back so often. Help me, God, to communicate your words. I love you. We love you. In the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So I, before I get into the passage here, I was talking about core values and we said generosity is one of our core values. But as I look at this message today, I, I believe that almost all five of our core values come out. Generosity is one of them. Fun is a core value at West Valley Christian. Amen. We like to have fun and think about it. If you're not stuck in debt, you can have some fun. Who wants to have some fun? I don't know about you, but I do. And then, and then excellence. Excellence is a core value. And I think when we're, we're, we're given these resources that God has given us and we're taking care of them the way that God has created us to do, we're, we're living in excellence. Amen? 
And then L is life change. We have a core value of life change. We're not interested in you coming into these seats and sitting in purple seats and, and, and falling asleep during the pastor's sermon. Uh, but, but, but our goal is, and I believe more importantly, God's goal is that you don't leave with information, but you leave transformation. That you leave transformed, that you do something with God's word and that changes your life. So life change is a core value and then team is a core value. We're not in this thing alone. We're not this, in this thing alone. And when it even comes to finances, some of us are trying to do it all on our own and we just haven't been equipped properly. It's not your fault, it's just the reality is that's not kind of one of your gifted areas. So you need to team up and get some help to get out of debt. Again, it's not just a question, can you imagine what life would be like debt-free? We want to get to the place where we could give testimony of saying, I am debt-free. Deuteronomy. Open up your Bibles to Deuteronomy, and if you need a Bible, uh, raise your hand. I know some of us have it on our mobile devices. Uh, We're going to go to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28, and if you were here last week for service, this is actually the real passage. I I, I laughed all week with my first Corinthians and supposed to Chronicles thing. Thank you for being so gracious. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 28. And I want you to hang in. We're going to read a lot of verses here, but I want you to hang in there because uh, this is something that we need to claim for our lives. This is, this is the, the foundation in which we're talking about here today, this whole idea of, of being set free uh, from, from debt. So Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse one. If you, if you, there, there it is right there. There's a, there's a condition, right? If, if, if you fully obey the Lord, your God. There's the, there's the condition right there. There's a responsibility. That, that's, that, that's what we have on us. We are to what? Obey God. See, part of my problem with my finances, you know, I didn't become a Christian until I was 18 years old. There's that situation. But then, and then, and then you know, it takes a little while to mature and grow uh, as a Christian. But I, I, finances, I, 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 it took me a while to figure this out. Let me just put it that way. Are you with me? And, and some of you are on that journey. Some of you are still trying to figure it out. Some of you have already figured it out. But here it is. If you fully obey the Lord, if you take God out of a marriage, good luck. Good luck. If you take God out of finances and how to manage them, good luck. Good luck. But right here it says, if you fully obey the Lord, your God and carefully follow all the commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. So you get to be on that roller coaster, but you're not stuck. (laughs) All the blessings will come on you and accompany you if you what, church? If you obey the Lord. Again, it's on you. He's not going to force himself upon you. That's the wonderful thing about God. And sometimes it's the frustrating thing about God. Sometimes I just wish he'd just jam himself into my life and make me do what's right. Can I even be more honest? Sometimes I wish he would jam himself into your life. (laughs) And make you do what's right. Oh... All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Now, what are those blessings? You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herd and the the lambs of your flocks, your baskets and your kneading, those will be blessed too. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. Now, I know some of you are sitting there. I don't give a rip about my crops because I don't have them. (laughs) And the calves of your herd. I understand I'm speaking to people in the San Fernando Valley. (laughs) I do much better in the Midwest, right? But some of you guys like this. I was born in the Midwest. I know what you're talking about, man. This is, okay, fast forward it. Put it in the context of your world today, your job, your family, your hard work. If we're putting God at the center of that, God is gonna bless and take care of it. Amen? Amen. Verse seven, the Lord will grant the enemies who rise up against you and will uh, will be defeated before you. 
They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath. If, if, oh, there it is. Gosh, why do you keep reminding me of this? If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in obedience. Because you know what the temptation then was? And you know what the temptation today is? And yes, I'm going to go there. And I hope you don't hate me for this. But please do not hear this as a health and wealth gospel message. Because there's no such thing in the Bible. It's not a message that says, oh, you just, you just turn to God and you pray to him and he's going to give you everything you want and you're going to have that Mercedes and you're going to have the bank account and you're going to have the jewelry and the furs and you're going to have the cool house and you're going to have the media room and yada, yada, yada. No, what this is saying is you get lined up with God and he's going to take care of you. Okay, there's no promises of all this stuff. I'm not sitting there as if he's a genie in the sky going, okay, I'm going to obey. And all of a sudden, all these wonderful things are going to come. No, just as you wouldn't want that as a parent, that's not God's desire. I don't want my children being good because they're going to get something from daddy. There's no authenticity in that. Yes, no. Okay, I got that out. You could disagree with me, but I'm right. <laughs> okay, you could, yeah, anyways. So, so, so the passage is continuing to establish this idea, if we obey God's command. Then verse 10, then all the peoples on the earth will see that you're called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and the crops of your ground in the land he swore to your uh, ancestors to give you. Now listen, verse 12, the Lord will open the heavens and the storehouse of his bounty to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention, it, there it is again, come on. He knows what we're like, right? If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord, your God, that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today to the left or to, or, or to the right, following other gods and serving them. Church, there's going to be a lot shared from this point on in the message. But if you walk out with nothing, hold on to this. This is so important for me. This again is like going to the chiropractor office with your neck out of alignment, your back out of alignment, and him just sitting there adjusting you, putting you back to center. Church, I don't know about you, but I struggle with this. I struggle with putting God at the center, whether it's relationship, whether it's finances, whether it's my driving, you fill in the blank. And what's beautiful about this passage right here is it's saying, you know what? There's a lot of things that are gonna hold you down in life. And we happen to be talking about finances. But the answer is always going back to the Lord and doing what's right. And you know what's exciting for me as a pastor here today? It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. The hope is for all of us. The hope is for all of us that we could do this right. Amen? Amen. The bondage of debt can be sickening. America is addicted to debt, including Christians. Yeah, we ought to know better, but we're certainly not perfect, amen? I don't know if you'd agree with this, but most people in our country don't know any other way to live, is my thought. 
debt seems to be just how you're supposed to do it. Why? Because everyone else is. If you're not in a life group, I'd encourage you to join a life group during this series because we actually are going through some workbooks that are really helpful that we'll give you. And in our class this week, uh, we had some new people too, and it was wonderful. But we asked the question, do you think that you could, you know, live debt free? And it's interesting because that question's being asked, not in Podunk, Missouri, but in the San Fernando Valley. And I'm not making fun of Podunk, Missouri, but I'll tell you the cost of living in the San Fernando Valley, if you haven't figured it out, it's pretty high, amen? And so we almost, we almost just give way to the idea of, I live in the valley, I'm stuck. <laughs> that is gonna be my thing. And that was some of the attitudes of the people in our class, and that's fair, I get it. But I wanna tell you something. That might be the attitudes of the people that live in the San Fernando Valley, but that's not God's attitude for each of us. Where we can't, he can. On Facebook, one of our young adults posted this, and I I stole it, um, but I'm not gonna give credit. (laughs) But he put this on his Facebook. He said, um, I love how I get paid. Amen? (laughs) I love how I get paid. And I'm like, yay, money. And 20 minutes later, I'm like, oh, man, I'm broke because I just paid my bills. (laughs) He's probably about 19 years old, and I'm just laughing. (laughs) You think it's bad now? But I'm thinking if a 19-year-old's got that mindset already working, it gets really sad when we're 60 and 70 and we still have that mindset, amen? Amen. We got to nip this stuff in the butt. I'm going to give you some crazy statistics. Um, And statistics are just that. They're just, they're just, you can find all kinds of stuff on this. But this is the stuff I found. 18 to 24 year old millennials right now, their average debt without school is $22,000. 25 to 34 year old millennials, their average debt is $42,000. Gen Xers, which I'm a Gen Xer, 35 to 49, well, I guess uh, it's 50. $39,000. Boomers, $36,000. Check this out. 104, in a, and this is in North America, uh, or not North America, just America, right here, United States of America. $104 billion was spent on credit card interest and fees last year. $104 billion. I'm going into a new business, church. This is my last day. No. <laughs> That's up 35% from five years ago. $927 billion in credit card debt. Now check this out. 44% of credit cards are not paid in full at the end of each month. So on average, people are paying anywhere from 14 to 29%. 44% of Americans are just paying the interest on credit cards. 80%, it's actually uh, 80.9% of boomers are in debt, 79.9% of Gen Xers are in debt, and 81.5% of millennials are in debt. Here's what I know when I came into the pulpit today, and I don't always know this. I know we have a lot of people that need to listen (laughs) to this. And maybe you find some comfort in this that, oh, praise God, I'm not the only one. (laughs) In a sick way. But wouldn't it be wonderful to sit in this place in two, three, four, five years and go, you know what, that's not me anymore. I'm in that that different percentage. Because when we can't, God can. David Rosenberg said this, He's a respected uh, economist. The ratio of household debt to disposable income is up from 30% ratio back in the 1950s to 125% today. And actually in 2007, it's 139%. Let me just simplify that for you. Back in 2007, Americans are living 39% more than what they're bringing in. So if I'm spending $139, but I'm only bringing in $100, I'm working backwards from day one. And yet the statistics are saying that's what the majority of us are doing. Now, going back to God's word, do you really think that's where he wants us to be? 
Do you think that's where he wants me to be? No. Dave Ramsey, famous author, Christian guy, he's all over the radio about finance. He says, let's face it, getting into debt is simple. It's, an easy, it's as easy as riding, <laughs> riding down the escalator at the mall. However, getting out of debt is like trying to walk back up the escalator that is coming down with people on it. It can be done, but it takes some real effort. While you are working your way out of debt, you will be tempted to back away and give up. Debt is a subtle but deadly snare. It's like a bear walking in the woods. You don't see the trap until snap, it's too late. Larry Burkett, he wrote a book called Debt Free Living and he says this, regardless of how it seems today, debt is not normal in any economy and should not be normal for God's people. We live in a debt-ridden society that is now virtually dependent on a constant expansion of credit to keep the economy going. That's a symptom of a society no longer willing to follow God's direction. Romans chapter 13, verse eight. Romans 13, eight. Let no debt remain outstanding except for the continuing debt to love one another. Let me read that again, Romans 13, eight. Let no debt remain outstanding except for the continuing debt to love one another. If you want to avoid the snare of debt, um, Barry Cameron in his book, ABCs of Financial Freedom, he gives seven things you need to know and we want to run through those here this morning. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, the Bible doesn't forbid debt, but it does discourage debt. The Bible doesn't forbid debt, but it does discourage it. I want you to go back to Deuteronomy. If you go back to Deuteronomy um, and we're going to go to... Um, Deuteronomy 15. Deuteronomy 15, verse 2. Let's just start with verse 1. At the end of every season, uh, of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan that has been made to a fellow Israelite. They shall not require payment from anyone among their own people because the Lord's time for canceling debt has been proclaimed. Now, church, if you really swallow that, uh, and we'll get there a little bit later, but, but right here, it doesn't simply say that there's no such thing as debt. Here it says, uh, it's giving an example that there's people that have debt. They've, 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 they've uh, been given a loan from somebody else. Now, what some of you are attracted to is this whole idea is after seven years, it's a race. Can we go back to the year of Jubilee? Amen, church? Every seven years, can you imagine your car loan? Oh, forgiven. <laughs> your mortgage payment? Oh, forgiven. The wedding ring? Oh, forgiven. Whatever it is, school loan? Oh, forgiven. Some of us want to go back to that. But this is just, the only reason I share this passage is it says, the Lord doesn't forbid debt, but he does, uh, does discourage it. Proverbs chapter 27, I'm uh, sorry, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7, it says this, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the slave to the lender. How many of you understand that? Now, don't raise your hand, but how many of us are slaves today? Because we are owing somebody something. Having said that, let's go to the second snare. The longest term of debt in the Bible was seven years. We just read that. Uh, in verses, uh, Deuteronomy 15, verses one and two. Uh, yes, there's a whole sermon I could give on the year of Jubilee. Yes, there was, there was loans made between uh, family members and like people. You didn't do this, uh, well, you could do it with foreigners, but you could also not hold them accountable to uh, canceling out that debt. But within the family, let's just say we're a family here, we could all loan to each other. But you know how we loaned it to each other? We would not ask you to, uh, we would not give you any 
any money that we knew that you couldn't afford to pay back. Now that's not part of our world today, is it? We say we do a bunch of paperwork. We look into a lot of history of what people can do, and what can, but we know we're in a lot of uh, problems because we're buying cars that are too expensive and houses that are too expensive, and we're putting out that $139 when we're bringing in 100, right? But again, this, this lesson says this, the longest term of debt in the Bible was seven years. And, and simply this point is just to say, you know what, don't overextend yourself. Don't overextend yourself. Now, I'm just going to give you a personal thing that I think is comical, and you might think it's comical f- for what I've done. But, you know, three, three-year car loan, okay, four-year, ah. Uh, but I'm hearing there's seven- and eight-year car loans. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Um, we're, we're overextending ourselves. Again, we're, 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 we're losing our future because we're always having to pay for our past. The the third snare that we need to watch out for is Jesus uh, endorsed the use of leverage and using banks to gain wealth. If you read the story of Matthew chapter 25, that's the parable of the talents, and you're going to see that each uh, servant was given different talents, and and eventually uh, some of them go and use those talents and put them to work, but one does what? He goes and digs a hole and buries it and plays it safe. The, the, The simple point I think that Barry Cameron is making here, and really what scripture is saying, which is more important, is that and let me just put it this way. Do you want to be paying interest on your money or do you want to be paid interest on your money? Think that through. You're all working hard. Do you want to pay interest on your money or do you want to be paid interest on your money? You see, if we're living in debt, what's happening? We're paying interest to everybody else. Everything that we're buying and everything that we're putting money into is costing way more than what that, 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 that price tag says on it. You realize that, right? Especially if you're just paying the minimum on credit cards, that $40 golf shirt is now a $3,000 golf shirt, you know, if you're just going to keep paying interest on it. But I I, I love this. I was never taught this. But man, I'm working hard for my money and I want my money to work hard for me. That way I could be debt free and I could be the most generous person out there. What do you think about that? Something to chew on. The fourth snare is if you're in debt, it affects everything you do. Your attitude towards life is generally affected by your debt. Would you, believe, would you say that's true? It affects the way that you approach everything. It affects the way you deal with relationships. It affects the way that you perceive people. It affects the way that you perceive things. It affects your schedule. It affects your health. If you're in debt, you don't want to get out of bed when that gets to a crazy amount. I have personal testimony of watching it in my own family. It breaks my heart. If you're in debt, you can't be generous, even if you have a generous heart, right? Someone sends you something like, I'm going to Uganda on a mission trip. I'd love for you to support me with $25. And you're like, I'd love to give you $50, but I could barely pay my electric bill right now. But when we're debt free, we could be generous beyond our imagination. The fifth snare that uh, Barry Cameron says is this (laughs) co signing isn't a sin, but it's stupid. Uh, Church, I don't want to get into the ugliness of this, but um, I know there's a lot of horrific stories out there. Do you know why people ask you to co sign? Because the bank says they can't afford what it is they're going to buy. Did you, I'm, it's that simple, right? And so they're asking you to come alongside and sign for it. Here's my, my thought on this. Being generous, because this sounds really mean, but being generous and being in a debt-free uh, environment and setting yourself up for that and your family for that, if someone asks you, especially if it's a family member, to help get that first house or that first car or whatever, Instead of loaning them that money, you give them that money. And with, with the, you know, and they say, hey, well, I'll pay you back. And if they pay you back, great. If they don't pay you back, 
you don't lose the relationship. Just within our church over 30 years of ministries, I've seen so many relationships destroyed because of this point right here. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 26 and 27 says, be not one of those who gives pledges, who put up security for debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, you should, why should your bed be taken from under you? Again, sometimes our heart overtakes our mind in this area of finances. God is just calling us to be responsible, to obey him. And as we do that, I believe you will be debt free. I'm not there yet. My wife and I, we still have a mortgage and we still have um, a car payment. But I hope one of those is done here pretty soon. But if I was to stand here in front of you five years ago, I would tell you about credit cards, right? So we had to start with a plan and start working our way. I, I, I don't have permission for this, but I'm aware of two families in our church that started this. And one of the families, uh, they started and they worked hard. I, I think it's been seven years. They're gonna probably pay off their mortgage this year. That's crazy living in the San Fernando Valley. But church, can you imagine how much freedom that family is gonna have now and how generous it could be done. Mary Hunt said this, there are only five things you could do with money. You could give it, save it, invest it, lend it, and spend it. You could give it, save it, invest it, lend it, and spend it. So why blow it? By getting in debt and losing it through paying interest to somebody else. Can you get out of debt? Can I get out of debt? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, I want to go back up to um, the sixth point. The sixth snare. If you're in debt, you ought to get out as quickly as possible. I didn't ask my wife for permission on this, so I may be needing to spend the night at someone's house this week. Um, but um, I think it's important to be vulnerable. I told you uh, last week that you know, we were in debt. I, I don't think it was crazy like some of these numbers, but we were still in debt and we were paycheck to paycheck like most of you guys, zero savings. Then we had this goal and the goal was to get rid of all credit cards because really how you get out of debt, you start with the smallest debt and work your way up. So if your debt is a credit card of $500 and then you have a $10,000 one, start with the $500 one. Pay that thing off and whatever payment you were making on that minimum of that, then you take that and add that to the payment for this one. And then when that's taken care of, you just work your way back. You work your way from the bottom up. And you, you got to start it now. And then you have celebrate. You can celebrate small victories along the way. Amen? So Lisa and I, that was it. we had to take care of credit cards and, and a car payment. So we got those done. Then we wanted to have savings. And so we worked hard and got to 5000 is what I told you. Actually, a little over 5000 within two years. Here's what I didn't tell you. Part of why we were paycheck to paycheck is we had the value of stay-at-home mom. I'm not telling all the rest of you that that's how you do it. But for us, it was important for me that um, Lisa was home. And so she was home. And then when the boys would hit kindergarten, then she could, you know, get a little part-time job here and there. So, so with that, you know, um, we, we made it paycheck to paycheck. We didn't have the two incomes, pastor income here in the Valley. So you fast forward, my youngest gets into um, kindergarten. And this is about the time that we start making these plans. Um, my wife, um, my wife cleans three houses a week. She's done that for a long time. She cleans three houses a week. But part of this plan was to get out of debt or to work towards that. She started moving about 200 to 416 pound boxes a week um, with a, a job that, that was able to make some more income. Then she got another job that allowed her to work at home on a computer. My wife works her tail off being a great wife and a great mom. But on top of that, she's done that other stuff. And that is how we got there. 
You don't get to debt free by just wishing and hoping that it happens. That's my point. You work hard. You work hard. But you got to do it quickly. (laughs) Don't start next month. Don't start next year. Start today. The seventh snare and the last one is God's plan is that we be lenders, not borrowers. That we be lenders, not borrowers. Right? Wouldn't that be amazing if you got to the point in life where you weren't stuck on top of an amusement park ride when everyone else is running around free and you're stuck because of debt. But what if you were that person that got your act together financially and that you could be that person that could be the most generous person? You're that auntie. You're that uncle. God can do that in your life. Amen? Jesus did that for us, didn't he? We racked up a bill of debt. It's called sin. Then he went and died on the cross and he paid it in full for us. We take that Jesus into our finances and when we can't, he can. Amen? Deuteronomy says, Do it God's way and watch what happens.